Welcome back to the big story of the Bible. My name's Sarah, and today we get to finish off the Old Testament. Let's review our story so far with this video. See if you can shout out some of the answers and blanks that we've left. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve, and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except there's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake and it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. that someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve. And this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise. And it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story when God singles out this guy named Abraham and says that through his family, goodness and blessing is going to be restored back to all of the nations of the world. And as we follow this family, we get to one of Abraham's great grandsons, this guy named Judah. And he receives this promise that a king is going to come from his line and that the whole world's going to follow this king and he's going to bring peace and harmony and there'll be lots of food and wine and milk and vineyards and it's going to be awesome. The first king that we meet from the line of Judah is a guy named King David and he's a hero. Maybe he is the snake crusher. But before we got to David last week, we saw how Abraham's family grew and then was enslaved in Egypt. We saw how God rescued them and how that was also an image of how he was going to rescue all of us because Jesus is the true Passover lamb. He died so that judgment would pass over you. Jesus is also the true, this is here, atonement goat and the scapegoat that cleanses us from our sins and takes away our sins from us, allowing us into God's presence. And it gets even better. Last week, we saw David defeat who? He defeated Goliath. And who got credit for David's victory? All the people. How does that point to Jesus? Jesus won the victory over sin and death, and we get credit for living like he lived. We get credit for his righteousness. Now back to our story. David grew, and he was the greatest king of Israel, a king after God's own heart. But even David, he, like Adam and Eve, saw something he wanted that he wasn't allowed, and he took it. He saw a woman that was already married and took her and then murdered her husband to cover up what he did. Sometimes you could be having a really good day, you know, like really obeying your parents and being respectful and getting along with your siblings and getting your schoolwork done, and then boom, you want something and you take it. You let your anger control you, your jealousy, your, your wanting of things, your impatience, and the whole day takes a turn. And you have to live with the consequences of what you did and the people you hurt. And you thought you were doing so good, and boom, you see how quickly your heart can turn to selfishness to sin. Can you share an example of when this has happened? David, after him, had a son. And his name was, does anybody know what his name was? Absalom. 
it was Solomon and he built the temple. It was like a stone permanent version of the tabernacle. Like the special place of God's presence now had a permanent home in Jerusalem. And like his father, he started off well with a heart that sought the wisdom of God to rule and reign God's way. But soon his heart turned to himself and he saw what he wanted, things he wanted and allowed and he took them and he took them and he took them. He collected money and women like property and horses and political alliances and he took and he took and everything he took, took his heart. And after him, the legacy of all his taking split the country in half in a civil war into the north and the south. And the north came to be called Israel and the south Judah. And both the north and the south had king after king after king. And though there were a few kings like David that led the south back to God, all the kings of the north and most of the kings of the south led the people to worship fake God after fake God after fake God like the fake gods of Egypt that God had saved his people from. And so God did what he had told them he would do way back when he made the covenant with Moses. This is what God said in Deuteronomy. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you draw away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. The first king that we meet from the line of Judah is a guy named King David. And he's a hero. Maybe he is the snake crusher. But it turns out that David is infected with the same evil as the rest of humanity. He never crushes the snake, just the opposite. However, God makes a promise to David that this king is going to eventually come from his line. But as you go on in the story, one by one, each generation of his sons, they're just total chumps. They give in to the snake, they choose evil, they go after money and sex and power and following other gods. Things get so bad that they run the nation of Israel right into the ground and the big bad empire of Babylon just takes them out. And so just like Adam and Eve had to leave the special place that God had given them, the special place of his presence, Abraham's family had to leave the special land God had promised to them. It's like, you know, sometimes your parents may say something like, don't slam the cupboard door or I'll have to punish you. And you do it and they give you a warning and then you do it again and then they give you another warning and then you do it again and again and they keep giving you warnings. And if they kept giving you warnings and warnings and warnings, would they be good parents? No, good parents do what they say they will to their children. And that's what God did. But the cupboard example isn't really great because it might like wreck your house a little and you shouldn't do it because your parents said not to do it. But what the people were doing was destroying themselves. They were doing things that hurt themselves and others so much. They'd become worse than all the nations around them. They were abusing the poor and orphans, ripping people off, sacrificing their children to other gods. It had to stop. And God used the Assyrians to carry away the Northern Kingdom from their land. And they had to go and live in other countries that were not their own promised land. And finally, God used the Babylonians to carry away the Southern Kingdom from their land. And worse of all, he allowed them to destroy the place of his special presence. It looked like heaven and earth were farther apart than ever. There was no place of overlap where God's presence was. And sometimes we can go through situations that are really hard, either circumstances around us or really hard, sad feelings inside us. And we feel like maybe God, maybe he isn't with us. Maybe he's not even real or maybe he doesn't care. You can feel like we've been exiled from his presence. Have you ever felt like that? Like God was really far away? Did you maybe realize later that he wasn't? Do you still feel like right now you're in exile? But way back when God had first made the covenant with Israel, he had told them that this would happen. He knew 
their hearts would turn away from him. And he also told them in Deuteronomy 36, the Lord your God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants. That's like the children and then children and the children of the children. So that you will love him with all your heart and soul so you may live. And so now there are no more kings to even fulfill this promise. So it seems like the whole plan is lost. But during these dark days, there's this crazy group of guys called prophets. And they just kept talking about this coming king and reminding us of the promise that he'll come, he'll defeat evil, he'll restore the garden. Now, one specific prophet, Isaiah, he tells us more about why this king is bitten. Isaiah says that the promised king receives this wound because of humanity's evil, and then it kills him. But then all of a sudden he comes back, and Isaiah says it's because he suffered this wound that he can now become a source of healing to other people. But the Old Testament ends, and the snake-crushing king that everyone's been talking about never shows up both before the Assyrians had taken away the northern kingdom and before the Babylonians had taken away the southern kingdom. And after both of those things had happened, people who spoke for God, people called prophets, spoke to the people and told them, turn your hearts back to God. And the prophets reminded them of the hope of all of God's promises that were left hanging, that were left unfinished from the Old Testament promises of, of a king like David that would sit on the throne forever, the promises of God to be in their presence, the promises of God to Abraham to make them a blessing to all nations. And one of those prophets, Jeremiah, told the people captive in Babylon that after 70 years, God would return them to the land promised to Abraham. Many years before God's people were taken to Babylon, God promised the prophet Jeremiah that the exile would last 70 years. Then, God would bring his people back home. God always keeps his promises. Cyrus, king of Persia, had taken over Babylon. God gave Cyrus an idea. <gasps> Cyrus said, let all of God's people go back to Jerusalem so they can rebuild the Lord's temple. Give them gold and silver and animals. Give them gifts for God's temple. The exile was over. God's people were free to go back to their homes. God's people got ready and their neighbors gave them gifts. Silver, gold, and animals and other expensive things. Zerubbabel and the high priest led God's people back to Judah. They had been away for 70 years. Many of the people were born in Babylon. They had never seen the land God had given their parents and grandparents. In all, thousands of people went back to Judah. They settled in their hometowns and set up their houses. Then the people met together in Jerusalem to rebuild the Lord's temple. First, the priest rebuilt the altar in the same place it used to be. They followed all the laws of God for building. When the altar was finished, they offered burnt offerings to God. The people also obeyed the law about special celebrations. They had a festival like God had told them to do, and they made sacrifices to God. Then God's people gave money to stonecutters and carpenters who would work on God's temple. They paid people to bring cedar logs to Jerusalem. Mm. Finally, when everything was ready, the people started to work. They laid the foundation of the temple. The foundation was important. It would make the building strong. When the foundation was finished, the priests put on special clothes and the people praised God. They sang, the Lord is good. His faithful love will last forever. Then the people shouted and praised God. They were so happy. The foundation of the temple was complete. Not everyone was happy, though. Some of the older people remembered what the temple had looked like 70 years ago, before it had been destroyed. They cried. The noise of the crying and shouting was so loud that the people could be heard far away. 
So this story doesn't end how you think it would. It's very anticlimactic. Like they're back in the land and they've rebuilt the temple. But when Moses built the tabernacle, God's presence descended heavy like a cloud and all the people celebrated. And when Solomon built the temple, God's presence descended heavy like a cloud and all the people celebrated. But even when the people finished building the temple, not just the foundation, God's presence didn't descend like it had before. There's something about being home, where everything's just right. We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, many do not. Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disoriented. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves, conquered by Babylon, living in exile far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? And the whole story of the Bible is designed to address those very questions. The whole story? Really? Yeah, go back to the first pages of the Bible. Where does humanity live? Okay, they live in this really sweet garden, their home. And they're there on one condition, that they trust and follow God's one command, and they don't. And so the consequence is banishment from the garden. Ah, they're sent into exile. Exactly. And so this story has been designed to set you up for Israel's story, how they were given the gift of the promised land and were able to stay there on one condition, that they be faithful to the terms of their covenant relationship with God. Um, They didn't, and they were sent into exile. And if you still don't see the parallel between exile from the garden and exile from Israel, think about this. In Genesis, humanity's exile led up to the story about the building of what city? Oh yeah, Babylon. The same place the Israelites are sent. But that's not the end of either story. In the first Babylon, God called Abraham to leave and travel to the promised land. And that story was designed to give hope to the Israelites currently living in the later Babylon. Now eventually, they do get to leave and travel back to their promised homeland. And when they did, it wasn't home sweet home. Oppressive empires were still ruling over them, and the people kept acting in the same corrupt ways as their ancestors. And so the biblical prophets said that exile wasn't actually over. How could they think they were still in exile when they're at home? Yeah, this is really important. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's Babylonian exile became an image of something more universal. It's that feeling of alienation and longing for something more no matter where you live. Yeah, I I can relate to this. I have a great home, but it's situated in a world scarred with pain and broken relationships, death, tragedy, done by others, but also done by me. And so in the Bible, exile is the human condition. We all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where you live, we are all longing for a better home. We're all longing for a better home. Like the people who were in exile in Babylon. Like even the people who returned and realized They were back in the land God had promised, but not really. It wasn't really theirs, and God's presence wasn't really there with them. But then, finally, the promise of all the prophets is about to step onto the scene. And this is why, when the New Testament begins, it introduces us to Jesus of Nazareth, not as some random guy, but as someone who comes to fulfill these specific ancient promises. Yeah, we learn that he's from the line of David, Judah, and Abraham. And he goes around Israel announcing that the goodness of God's kingdom is here now. And he begins confronting the effects of evil on people by healing them, by forgiving them of their sins and evil. Many people are now believing that this is, in fact, the promised king. But Jesus began telling his closest followers that he was going to become king and bring peace by taking the full effect of humanity's evil into himself. The fatal snake bite wound. Exactly. And so it seems like the serpent wins. And this story actually would be a tragedy except for what happens next. Jesus rises from the dead. 
And now Jesus has the power over evil and death for himself. And so the rest of the New Testament is then making this claim that Jesus' power over evil and death has now become available to us to begin confronting the effects of evil in our lives. But even still, death and evil are a real problem in our world all around us. And so the story of the Bible ends by describing this future day when Jesus comes back and he finishes the job. He destroys the snake once and for all and he restores the goodness of the garden here on earth. This is the good news that all the Old Testament points to. People's hearts keep turning away from God, keep turning away from God, and he keeps pursuing them. And they keep turning away, trusting themselves, trusting the snake, giving into selfishness. We keep trusting ourselves, trusting the snake, giving into our own selfishness. Earlier, we talked about a time you did something selfish that had consequences. After you did that, did you promise people, yourself, God, that you never do it again? Did you try really, really hard not to? I bet you did. But what happened? How did that go? I bet you've done it again since. Or if Yahoo, good job, you haven't done that thing, I bet you've done a different selfish thing just as bad. Trying really hard? doesn't change our hearts. It can't. But who can? Jesus can. Like God promised the people before they went into the promised land. He knew they couldn't do it. That they wouldn't only follow him. That they'd keep turning their hearts from him. And so he promised them that one day he would give them a new heart. The Lord your God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart and soul and so you may live. And because Jesus defeated the power of sin and death, because he crushed the snake, because he's the Passover lamb and the goat of atonement, because he won the battle for us, he can give us his heart. Remember when God's presence was on the mountain after they'd come out of Egypt and he invited all the people to come up into his presence and they wouldn't. So Moses went for them and then God's presence came down to them. After 400 years of living with a less than temple, after 2000-ish years of people not coming into God's presence, he was going to come to them in the flesh, in a body, in a baby. And that is the next part in the big story of the Bible. Today, you can pray and ask God to give you a new heart. You can say sorry for not trusting him and pray that Jesus will give you his heart and start to make it possible for you to love him with all your soul and all your heart and all your mind. Today's craft is super simple. This wooden heart with a little string hanger to hang it on. On one side of the heart, write some of the things, the selfishness that you struggle with, the things in your heart that keep you turning away from God, that keep you not trusting him. On the other side, you're going to write Deuteronomy 36 to remind us of this key verse that we looked at today. And then you can write the simple prayer, Jesus, give me your heart. And you can hang this somewhere, maybe somewhere that you see in the morning to remember that you don't have to get rid of all this stuff by trying really hard. As you come closer and closer into Jesus' presence, he will transform your heart and give you a heart more like his. And we will see you next week.